We just thank you, Lord, for your word that burns on the inside of us here. We thank you for the privilege to walk in the calling of Christ Jesus. We thank you that we can be living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable unto you because you've made a way where there was no way when it was impossible with God, it was impossible with you. I thank you today, Lord, that we get to stand in the midst of a place that's been made, a place that's already been paid for, a place and live it out as if you were living through us. And we thank you, Father, that all these things are possible in you. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing on your word. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by the Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And we thank you, Father, that we get to put on the garment of the Holy Spirit. And you said it's better if I go, because when I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you can be also, and you can be seated in heavenly places with me. And I'm going to send a comforter that you'll know all things, that you'll have no need for anyone to teach you because I will bear witness in you. And this fire, this passion, this power is living on the inside of each one of you here today. And I just pray that you would access the privileged place of the supernatural realm in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a mouthful, but I'm really excited because I'm starting a new series today. It's called Empowered. And uh, the reason why I, I felt so on my heart is because I feel like sometimes we're reading scriptures and we don't understand the application of the empowerment behind the application. So we just read about what it says that we could have, but we don't know how to have it. It's different to know about something But it's very different to walk something out so that people go, oh, it's that easy. It's time we stop trying to make the church a place where superstars rise and a place where common folks excel. See, I was very common. I was very common. I was a drug addict. I lived in Baltimore City. I was going to college. Praise God. I I had a dad that wanted me to get through college. And I'm very excited about that. And I, I, I actually didn't even think it was... A good deal because I had to work through college and everybody else got to party through college. So I was like, well, it's still not fair. It's no matter how grass, green your grass is, somebody else's grass always looks better. And I don't know what it is about that, but it's pathetic and it's a lie from the enemy. You should be so content and thankful in all things for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Whatever you've been given, it is a gift and there's much worse places you could be today. There's much worse things that could be going on in your life. And if you forget about where you could have been and where you have been, you're going to forget that God deserves a praise today. Come on, somebody. God deserves a praise today. God deserves a praise whether your praise is broke or not. He deserves a praise. (laughs) It was funny. Somebody told me on Friday night, he said, I see you jumping down there and everything. I think he was probably 25. I said, I said, oh, that's very special. He said, well, I was really tired, so I couldn't, I couldn't get that into it. But, I, but I, I saw you down there, Pastor. I said, well, guess what? I said, I drove four hours today, worked eight hours, and then I came straight to this place and jumped straight into the pool. And I gave my God a praise because my praise is not tied to how I feel any longer. I don't know about you and what you think about praise, but my praise is always necessary. My praise is always necessary. God deserves a praise. Rather I feel like it, I don't feel like it. Rather I'm tired or rather I'm energetic. Rather I drank a Red Bull and I got wings or rather my wings are clipped. I don't care what you think. You need to have a praise. Your praise doesn't come from something in the natural. It comes from the supernatural realm. The supernatural is so much more realistic and tangible than we give access, than we give credit to. Joy is the same thing. If you think you have to feel right to get a praise on, then you're going to think you got to feel right to have joy. <laughs> joy is a supernatural gift, people of God. Just like faithfulness. My praise is a faithfulness. It's a thankfulness. My praise comes out of who I am and what I've been through. I've been forgiven much and I <laughs> love much. I've been forgiven much and I love much. And sometimes we just forget what we've been forgiven of. I don't want to be a forgetful person. Forget where I came from. That's right. The people that are forgetful, Pastor Tracy said, are the people that are unmerciful. 
They're ungracious. They don't, ben, they don't manifest the fruits of the Spirit because they lost track of who they were before Christ. And then they see everything, everybody else on the path and they just say, you're not arrived yet. Well, if they take a good look in the mirror, they might see the same thing today. I'm just saying, you know. Because none of us have arrived. We're all in transition to the wholeness that God has provided for us. So we might not be perfect, but we're surely forgiven. And that's putting us on a path to the greatness that God's called us into. It's a privileged place. Can you say amen? So we've been empowered and we've been empowered for many things. And I have a lot of topics I want to share about this. But today I just want to start with the core value of our house and a core value of what we what we have here. And uh, especially my wife, I always talk about her because she's given me the gift. If, if I didn't have Jesus uh, to, to give it to me, I had someone in my life that knew how to manifest the gift of love. And uh, I'll tell you this, I'm empowered to love today. And you are empowered to love today. And we're not going to be talking about what it means to love and what love looks like. We're going to be talking about how do you become love. And it's a different topic than what love is and agape and phileo and going through all the loves. We need to actually figure out how do I look like love? How do I shine love? How do I become what Jesus looks like so that the earth can be filled with his glory? We can't keep talking about the glory of the Lord if you don't want to shine the glory of the Lord. If you don't open your mouth or put your hands together or dance a dance, you can't give him praise. You can sit there and say, I'm praising him on the inside. Inside praise don't move nothing. Jesus spoke to things and they, they resonated and they moved. They moved in the position and the direction of the words he spoke. So we have to realize that when I move, I'm moving earth. And if I sit there and go, well, it's on the inside. It, you, you know, your, your, your faith can be on the inside, but your faith ain't moving nothing. Faith is action. James talks all about that. So we're going to be talking about being empowered to love today. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is living on the inside of us. You guys bear witness to that. The scripture says the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the grave lives on the inside of us. Now, I just want you to get your head around that for a second. The same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is the same spirit that hovered over the face of the deep in Genesis. When the spirit of the Lord hovered over, it produced a place where words could be spoken so that the word and the spirit could agree so that life could manifest. Is that you guys would go with that? The spirit of the Lord hovers over darkness and looks for agreement on the earth or word to agree. Jesus said, I don't do anything except for what I see my father doing. What he was saying is, I look for my, I look for my father and I see the spirit. And I know his spirit and then I come in agreement and alignment and I speak what he says. This is really important because there's so many people speaking different things that don't line up with what God would say over somebody's life. What God would say over your life. You can't look in the mirror and say things about your life that don't say what God says about your life. And expect to manifest a kingdom reality. We want to have a kingdom reality in our life. We want to walk in favor. We want to walk in the promises of God. Well, first we have to realize that God's spirit hovers and I need to come into agreement and speak what he's saying. Amen? So we love because he first loved us. Jesus modeled love okay jesus modeled love why is love so important because there's a deficit in the world there's a deficit of love in the earth and if you a lot of times when we talk about love we ain't talking about the same love god's talking about and i'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because you've heard lots of teachings on love love is has different meanings to different people sometimes you know they think the world says that if you love somebody you give yourself to them We're talking about sexual matters, right? We're all grown ups here. We're talking about sexual relationships. If you love somebody, you give yourself to them. But let me tell you something. If you love somebody, you'll respect them enough to wait 
for them. Who are you really loving when you want somebody to give to you? It's truth. I got one amen right here on the front row. Well, I'm glad you're sitting on the front. I needed some encouragement, brother. Because no one wants to say it like it is. But when we, when we don't, what we don't realize is we're setting things into motion when we're living for ourselves in our relationships, in our marriages, and in our children, and our family units. What we're doing is what we're saying was, you have to serve me. You have to make me happy. You're on this planet for me. And that doesn't work too well. I don't know if you've noticed. Maybe you haven't been married or maybe you haven't married, married long enough. But usually the first couple months will do you in. You'll wake up real quick. You'll be like, whoa, I thought you were like coming into my life because you was going to make everything peaches and cream and shiny and sunshine all the days of my life. What happened? Now you want me to do something for you? Era, I love Mohan's quote, so I'm going to say Mohan's quote from when, what we learned in India. He said, he said, let me tell you something. Love is blind and marriage is an eye opener. <laughs> and it's, it's good because what I learned is different is I wasn't made for myself. I was made for love. And that's what my wife needed. She didn't need someone that was constantly pulling from the well of her life and saying, give me this, give me that. Do this, do that. And I'm constantly pulling, and that's how I was. I was very religious. I said, you submit, woman, because that's what the Bible said. Come on, I cracked the whip. And then my whip app got broken. You guys... If you guys were there, I had my whip app on my phone, and next thing you know, I think she sabotaged it. See, I got, he's, he's got his, but I think that's his wife's phone. <laughs> oh, sorry, Chris. You just, like, threw yourself out there. I, just, I couldn't resist. I asked for forgiveness later. So why is love so important? Love's important because there's a deficit in the earth. Here's what it says in 1 Peter 4, 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Listen to this. I got some cross references here just so you can get a picture of this. Proverbs 10, 12 says hatred stirs up conflict. So where does conflict come from? Hatred. Stirs up conflict. Another place that com conflict comes from is contention, which comes from pride. Listen, guys, it's not bad for you to say, like, I, s I feel like I'm manifesting contention or I'm in the middle of contention. And usually we blame whoever we're contentious with and we don't take any ownership of the contention that we're stirring up. We're kind of part of the party, but we want to blame the other person for the party. It's like you're stirring up this mess, but it's your mess. It's like, wasn't I playing the game, too? You see what I'm saying? So contention and, and, and here we got this hatred. And then the last one, Proverbs 17, 9 says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense. But whoever repeats the matter separates even close friends. Okay, this is a super good scripture because if you feel like relationships are constantly breaking in your life, it's because of things like this. And rather than blaming everyone, take the common denominator and fix it before you worry about fixing the world around you. If I could just take a good look and say, God, I don't like that about me. And you said, whatever I don't like, I could give you, you would give me an upgrade. You give me beauty for ashes, for example. Whatever he doesn't like about me, I stopped condemnation a while back. And if you're still there, please let it go. It doesn't belong to you. Condemnation's not your portion anymore. Here's your portion. Father God comes down, takes his time to spend with you, and highlights things that don't belong in you. And then he says, what do you think about that? And most of us go, oh, I'm a wretched sinner. Don't look at me. Don't talk to me. And I got, gave up that stuff because I said, well, God, if you showed it to me, you must want to do something about it. And if you're big enough to show me it, you're big enough to take care of it. So I said, Lord, I just take this and I give it to you. I'll give you an example. Somebody was preaching a couple weeks ago and he says. He was preaching about um, just different how de denominationalism has separated churches, right? And in general, you know, we all feel like we got the best revelation in town. 
and you know, ours is better than yours, and when yours is a little different, then you're really off because you're not aligning yourself with my revelation. Is that right, Matt? See, Matt says it's right. That, so, so Matt says he's here because we got it right. So, so what we tend to do is we get on a pedestal and everyone else is beneath us or they become like outcasts instead of realizing that it's one body and it's his body. And so no matter what somebody's revelation is and, you know, these guys could be wrong because of this and these guys could be wrong because of that. I said at the end of the day, I probably got quite a few areas God's still trying to get me right on to. Not you guys, I said me. I said me, you can agree that I probably got some things to work on too. Don't worry, I didn't want to say you, I, I was talking about me. I, I, so I'm driving and I say, Lord, sometimes I feel like because what you're doing, I'm so excited, you know, we're three and a half years old, we're growing so fast and you're, you're having to help us with all these things. I'm so excited at, and I feel like that what he said could be true for me. And I don't ever want to separate myself from any group of people that are yours. Ever. Because every group has something beautiful to offer. And then I, I was talking to somebody about this because I said the Baptist church has amazing reverence for the word of God. The Catholic church has an amazing reverence for the people in position and authority. And so that's an amazing gift because there's plenty of people that should probably learn that lesson. Maybe they need to go to a little Catholic church for a little while, get it all right, and then come back and then, you know, we'll have that together. So the reason why I want to honor is because what, here's the key. Here's the key, guys. Whatever I honor is accessible in my life. You guys with me on that? Whatever I honor is opened up so that I can have access in my life. So whatever I dishonor, I'm closing the door to. So when I stop seeing the value in your life or another group in the, in the body of Christ, and I say, you know, I don't think I like that. Because it's different. And I close the door. I'm closing the door to that difference in my life. Maybe that balance. Maybe that, that revelation. So here we go. I'll read that again. Whoever would foster love covers an offense. Whoever would foster love covers an offense. And again, I, out of 1 Peter 4, 8, I said, Above all things, be fervent and have love one for another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Now, what's that actually mean, guys? It sounds bad. <laughs> love covers a multitude of sins. Until you see what a mom's like, it's the most amazing thing to watch a mom in action. Like, m mom has a boy who's an angel, of course, right? You guys know. Like, mama has Freddie. Freddie's an angel. Alexis is an angel. Everybody's an angel to mama. Mama's kids are mama's angels. And it's so amazing how mama loves her kids. Mama nurtures her kids. Mama sees no wrong in her kids. Her kids are beautiful kids. And, they're, and the most amazing thing is the way mama sees her kids is the closest thing I've ever seen to love on the earth. Because what happens is mama's kids go play with Johnny. If your name's Johnny, give it a different name. Because <laughs> Johnny likes to cause trouble in mama's perfect little kids. What mama don't know is Johnny could be influenced by mama's kids. But mama never sees that. It's always Johnny's fault because mama loves her kids so much. In the same manner, there are enemies in life waging war against you. And those enemies, the Lord looks at those enemies as your enemies and his enemies. He takes it very personal that things are trying to keep you astray or keep you locked down in a fortress and think you're protecting yourself, but you're really isolating yourself. You think you're, 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 you know, you're, you're safe because you've got these thick walls and what you're doing is you're cutting the life off that God wants to bring to your life. Because relationships... No matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert, just means that the size of the relationship should be different, uh, you know. Uh, but we have to realize that the enemy's plans are, are always against us, and God's always, his enemies are our enemies. And we can't sit there and get frustrated with one another, not realizing, like, like <laughs> I love it because Thomas was not Jesus. 
You got, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Stephen. Stephen in the Bible, book of like Acts chapter 5-ish. He was not Jesus. You guys are with me that, that far, right? So most of us live a life and we say, I'm not Jesus. But Stephen wasn't Jesus either. But while he was watching the rocks hurl down. Crushing into his body, into his arms, wounds in his flesh, wounds are gaping into his head. And he looks at him and sees Jesus at the right hand of the Father and says one important statement. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. Very famous quote that all of you guys should memorize. If there's a scripture to be memorized, I would beg that you remember that one. Forgive them, Lord, because they don't know what they do. You know, if it was the woman that was laying on the ground and she had just committed adultery and Jesus is writing in the sand and says, he that's without sin cast the first stone. If that woman was Stephen, she would have understood that they don't know who they are and they don't know what they're doing. But because she was not in that, she didn't have that revelation because she hadn't been forgiven yet. The forgiveness and the love of God is the only access point you have to have love in your life. Real love is, an, is, a, is a revelation of what God is in your life. What God has done in your life. And without that, they don't know what they're doing. We need to stop taking people personal and start realizing they don't know who they are because you haven't shown them yet. <laughs> We can blame everybody else, but until you're ready to show somebody, you haven't even begun to love. Well, this is what it looks like to take up your cross, mom. This is what it looks like, honey, to take up your cross, okay? You want to just keep throwing the stones. Okay, let's go. I'll carry. You throw. It's your turn to throw. I threw yesterday. You know what I mean? We don't know. The main thing is we have to get to a place where we have to realize that we're here to manifest love into the earth. We're not here to, to, to let everybody love us and say that's what God did. Oh, it's favor. Praise the Lord. Love is... <laughs> love for self is not love at all. You guys with that? Love for self is not real love at all. It's not even close. You would say it's love, right? If you love me, honey, you'll call me. If you love me, honey, you'll do this. If you love me, honey, you'll prepare my lunch and iron my clothes. Actually, I didn't even know wives did that anymore. And she started doing it. I was like, God, you're so good. Then I got mopey when she didn't. See what I mean? You're never happy. So it's just like, oh, you didn't iron. I'm all wrinkly today. The best ironing I can do is, like, get it wet and throw it in the dryer. That's, like, good ironing right there. Come on. My dad has a different revelation. He says, if, if your clothes are wrinkly, you throw them away and get other clothes that don't wrinkle. I said, that's a good thinking. Because there's clothes that don't wrinkle that much. So, so love for self is not love at all. Listen to this, guys. Love is a giver. Love is a person. And the Bible says it this way, God is love. Okay? Love is not selfish. Love is a person. And that love is a giver. And that lover is God. God is love. If you want to know what love looks like, you have to first look at love. You can't look at the world and you can't look at di dictionaries and Webster and try to like study it out. You have to actually meet the person who is love. Okay? Now, there's a, I'm going to just get a little bit of a teaching here. There's a thing called symmetry. And what it means is if A equals B and B equals C, then a equals C. You guys ever heard of that? It's Boolean logic, algebra if you want. It's, uh, it's, it's things that computers were made on. So I know a lot about that area. So I'm sharing. There's a thing called symmetry. A equals B. And if B equals C, 
Therefore, A automatically equals C. Okay? So if God is love, then that means anything that love is, God is. If you're talking about agape. Okay? Now I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians 13 with that. Okay, just verse 4 through 8. I don't know if she actually changed the, um, the text, but I changed the text from love to God. Okay? Now listen to this. This is what God is. If you want to see, people are always trying to look for God. They say, God, just show me yourself. If, in fact, his own disciples said, if, if the Father's real, just show us and we'll be happy. <laughs> Moses asked for that. And we're going to talk about that in a second. If anyone saw God, your flesh would be no more. No one sees God and live. And here's what, so, so here, here's what God looks like. Okay? God suffers long and is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. He is not puffed up. He does not behave rudely. He does not ever seek his own. He is never provoked. He thinks no evil. He does not rejoice in iniquity. He rejoices in the truth. He bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. And he endures all things. Because God never fails. Come on somebody. God never fails. Love never fails because God never fails. And so what you need to realize is sometimes when you're reading about love, you need to be putting my father right here. Because my father never fails. That's why love never fails. We're not talking about your love you give me. I'm talking about the love he gives me. I'm talking about the love, let me say it this way, the love that he is. <laughs> okay? Another thing about God is if he says he is something about symmetry, if he is something, that means he embodies it. That means he takes over all of it. That means every area that is love is God. And every area that is God is loving. So when you see God through the eyes of like how your father treated you or what you've been through in life, and I don't know why God would ever let that happen. People say that to me all the time. If you don't know why God would let that happen, you still haven't even figured out God didn't let it happen. If you want to know still why people suffer, it's not because God it's because people. I mean, read, learn, study, but never blame God who is love on doing something evil. He doesn't even think of evil. He doesn't think of wiping people off the earth. In fact, Jesus said it this way. When his disciples got ticked off and they were like, where's the right hand man now? He would probably listen to us. I'm going to tell them, hey, let's set fire. We'll just cast down fire on that village. We're going to take them down because they, they didn't appreciate us when we came in. They didn't give us a good offering. And we're just going to blast them. Fire, Lord. Come on. Give it to us. Tell us we can do fire. We got fire? He says, uh, really? <laughs> you guys excited there. Uh, you don't even know. What spirit you're of. Do you guys hear that? That's the language of Jesus talking about his father and what love looks like. You don't even know what spirit you're of when you're talking about destroying something God loves. We can't talk evil against people and think we're even going to become like love. Evil should never come out of the mouths of the people of God because evil is not what love is. It's not who God is. And if you want to become like your father, you've got to start exercising some authority, starting with this guy right here. Put a bridle on it, put a key in it, lock it up until it knows what to say. Say it this way, guys. Because a lot of people are like, it's really hard to, you know, stop cussing. It's really hard to not say bad things. I'm, I have a hard time when, you know, not gossiping or whatever it is. I'll tell you the secret. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Whatever is coming out of your mouth, you need to be really aware that that's what's in you. The Bible says it also this way. When a man's eye is dark, how deep does that darkness go? The heart is deceivingly wicked. And who shall know it? Another verse. How many can I give you? The reality is, when we don't guard our heart, 
We let anything come out of our mouth. And the reason why evil comes out of our mouth is because we're not filled with the goodness and the love of God in the, on the inside. Our hearts need to be filled. I'll say it this way. Psalmist David said it best when he said, Thy word, O Lord, have I hid in my heart that I wouldn't sin against you. You don't, you couldn't even imagine what one week in the word would change your life forever. One week in the word would make you think like, what was I thinking last week? With just one week, it could actually, I've actually seen people do it in like four hours. You go into a closet, four hours with the Lord, you're pouring new stuff in, the junk's coming out, you come out of the closet and you got your ass back, you know? The kryptonite, I don't know where it went, but all of a sudden you're ready to go. It's really important because... It's really important because we want, to be, we want to be overcomers, right? So love never fails because God never fails. So how can I be empowered to love? How can I be empowered to love? Because it's great that love loves all these good things. But I need, I'm starting to talk about the practical side when I'm starting to talk about filling your heart and filling the well of your life. The well. You're a well. And what comes out is what's been poured in. The object of your affection. If your affection is carnality, if your affection is lust, if your affection is money, then that's what comes out. And that's what you talk about, your love. When I, when I met my wife, we were just crazy. We were crazy. We, 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 we would uh, leave church, and we'd be at Friendly's, and then we'd be having... So much fun, they'd kick us out of the restaurant. That was like 12-something at night. And then we would sit in the parking lot till like 3-something in the morning. And both of us are going, oh, we should go home. We should go home. The kids are already like passed out. She didn't even care she had kids. I mean, terrible mom. I mean, I was like, poor kids got to go to school. They're like drooling on themselves in the back seat. Like, mom, come on. At first, they probably thought it was cool, and then after a while, they're like, get a life, Mom, come on. And so, yeah, you guys ever stop talking, just be done. And, and so, the interesting thing is, because there was so much love in us, it pulled out just more, 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 I want more, I want more, I want more. If there's no desire for the things of God, you start this way, guys, it's really easy. It's so easy, I told you, let's let go of condemnation. I don't like the fact that I don't have a desire for your word. I don't like the fact that I don't have a, a desire to praise you or to or to or to pray. And I just pray over like my meal and it's kind of religious. And I just ask, Lord, you just take what I am and give me what you are, because you said you and I are one. You and I are one. Whatever you have, you want to give to me. And it says he'll give liberally and he won't hold back. Is that good news? He'll give liberally to your life and he won't hold anything back. So here, here we're going to read this, and I, I, this is amazing scripture. I'm not going to be able to take as much time as I want, so you guys study this um, this week. 1 John chapter 4. This will do you in for sure. Thank you, Lord. We just welcome you, Holy Spirit, to transform our hearts right now. As we read your word, your word is truth. Your word's alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. Able to split between soul and spirit, Lord. We're alive in you. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Come on. So here's what it says. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Follow along. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God. And they know God. On the contrary, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Through him, we might live through him. In this love, which is the love through him, not that we loved God, 
but that he loved us and he sent his son as the perpetuation or a ransom or the payment of ransom for our sins. Beloved, if God so, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. Listen, I love all the people that go to heaven and see visions and see God. But here's the key. You can only see a piece of God. You're not going to see the Father. It's pretty clear, right? No one has seen God at any time. Now, this is John the Revelator, so he had some pretty good insight on the track of seeing cool stuff. I mean, he gets to see seraphim and cherubim and think angels with four faces and details of the faces, and they have six wings, and they cover this and that, and it's like, whoa, that's awesome, and you see somebody, and you just fall to your face because you're just like so overwhelmed by what you're seeing. That's revelation. That's good stuff. And so he has this kind of inside track, and he says, no one has seen God at any time, because if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. I I need to add more balance to that, because I want to make sure that you're You're tracking with me. You can only see a piece of God because he's too big to see and live. It's it's kind of like, hey, I I can see the sun from here. That's cool. You're seeing a vantage point. But could you imagine if you could just step onto the surface of the sun? Oh, this is very exciting for about a nanosecond. (laughs) If you could just teleport right on the face of the sun, you'd be like, well, that's... And that's just the sun. That's just nuclear power. Could you imagine Abba power? That's just nuclear power. In fact, God holds all things in the universe by his hand. He holds them together. He holds, I I don't know, I was a real physics buff. I loved physics so much. Like, if you started talking physics to me, we would just go crazy for a while. But two protons sticking that close together. I don't even know if you guys know this, but... But as they, as they get closer together, you guys did, played with magnets before, and you start getting close, and they start doing this number, and they don't want to stick. Well, what's interesting is, as they get closer, it squares the amount of power that they repel each other. Okay? So much so that when they start getting that close, they're touching almost. And all that power, somebody named Albert Einstein decided, what would happen if we were to split the atom. And then he talks about this E equals MC squared. And he says, if I were just to take the little mass there and multiply it by the speed of light, then I would release the power that's inside just two protons. And so he made this atom smasher, and he splits this atom, and this explosion goes, and there we learn about Atomic power, when just one atom is split into two. And God is holding the universe together with his mighty right hand. (laughs) We just split one and like almost blew up the world. (laughs) And we're like, oh, I seen God. That's cool. I guess through the keyhole. We do have access. Don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to give some, some what I'm saying. Some, some light to you because I believe in seeing God. I believe we see him through this. In fact, we see him through love. No one has seen any God, any, any God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And if his love has been perfected in us, this we know that we abide in him and he abides in us because he has given us his spirit. Okay? No one has seen God at any time. If we, oh, hold on. I had that written down twice. Sorry about that. Verse 14 says, and if we have seen and testify that God the Father has sent the Son as a Savior into the world, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. So start confessing Jesus is the Son of God, and his love will start to manifest on the inside. And he in God. And we have known and believed that the that love that God has, Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. The love that God has for us. For God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God is in him. Okay? Listen. If we abide in love, 
we abide in God, in God and God abides in us. It's a reciprocation, guys. So if you want to be empowered to love, if you need more love in your relationship, love in your life, you have to start by abiding in Him. What does abiding in Him look like? Well, if I want to say something that doesn't look like something Jesus would say to my wife, then I better figure out how my tongue can stop working and my lips can stop moving until something like Jesus wants to come out. Because if I want to abide in Him, I can't say what He wouldn't say. And the crickets said, amen. No, not you guys. You guys were like, that sounds so hard, pastor. I don't know if that's possible. Well, John thought it was possible because he wouldn't have wrote this passage. The Beatitudes are an example to us to become like love, okay? The Beatitudes, I was asking the Lord this. Why, why every time you ask somebody ask you for something, are you supposed to go above and beyond? Because the bare minimum that you could do to just make them think you were answering their request is what they asked for. You guys hear me? But when you can do far beyond what they even asked for, they're going to realize something is different about you. See, if we get to a place where we're just doing the bare minimum of what somebody asked for, like my wife says, hey, can you do this? You're supposed to do that and then a lot. Because it's the lot past what you asked for that shows her God is love. And I am in love. And love is in me. Because God is in me. And I start showing that I'm going far beyond what you asked for. Because what you asked for was just for you. But I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this so that you know that somebody exists in this world. That wants to show you that you're valued far beyond what you've asked for. Or even think. If you guys know it says when you give it shall be given back to you. Good measure pressed down shaken together. Running over shall men give unto you into your bosom. What God wants you to be is a person that when somebody asks of you. You're like oh no problem. How can I triple that? How can I quadruple that? How can I show excellence so that when they see what I've done. They see that it was too big for a person. And it had to be God. That's what we need to look like. And if you want to manifest love, and if you want to become love, you've got to start thinking different. Because so as a man thinks, so is he. So as a man thinks, so is he. You become what you believe. You already are what you believe. And what you don't like about yourself is just one prayer away. God, I give this to you. And I receive everything that you give to me. I just pray for fire on that area of my life. I've just seen things just constantly falling off my life as I just began to pray this way. I didn't have to struggle and strive. I just believe God wants to take it because that's why he brought it up. Hey, you got that uh, dirty stain on there. I'm like, hey, you want to take care of it? Yeah, he doesn't want me looking all grimy. He wants me shiny. He don't want me wrinkly, honey. He wants me without spot or blemish. That's right. Come on, Chris. Help me out. <laughs> All right. So here we go. The B attitudes are an are example of becoming love. Uh, we, we talk about empower, being empowered. We're talking about empowered for love, by love, and to love. We're empowered for love. God has a purpose in giving his son so that he would inherit many sons that know how to look like love. So we were empowered for love. In other words, we were empowered to distribute love. But he was empowering us for love, and then he empowered us through or by love so that we could become love verse or to love with the commission to love. So as we're empowered to love this world, we have to stop feeling like everybody's against me. We have to stop feeling like the world's against me. Let me tell you how the people of God think. If God be for me, who can be against me? 
If God be for me, he's more than the world against me. If God is on my side, it doesn't matter what's on the other side. My scale's in favor. My scale's been tilted. I think I got a fixed match and I'm going to win. And that's the way I can believe. You know what? And I've seen it time and time and time and time and time again. And now 18 years, I'm about to believe this thing. And you can just believe it now or you can wait 18 years. It's up to you how long it takes you to believe what God said about you. But I believe that God has put me in a match where I have the biggest opponent, uh, the biggest, the biggest, um, no, no, the biggest, I got the biggest guy on my side. You know what I'm saying? I got the biggest partner. The, uh, Lance Wallnow was draw, drawing uh, the Philistine Goliath, and then he drew, he's like, so God's on your side, and he draw, draws this boot. And like the boot is as big as the Philistine, 10 foot tall. So he's just like, <laughs> there goes Goliath. <laughs> Ally, that's, there we go. Brain failure, Lord. I trade brain failures for firing neurons. <laughs> so here we go. And I'm going to end on this. No one has seen God at any time. Um, and I talked a little bit about that, but I want you guys to see this. There was a guy named Moses in the Old Testament. Moses had this desire to see God he had this prayer Lord I want to see your glory show me your face this is a passionate prayer guys show me your face I'm not willing to just see you in a bush burning I want to see your face and God says in fact Joe come on up here and Chris I have you come up here Chris is short for Christ so you're going to be Jesus for a second. Don't let go to your head. But, but uh, no, just kidding. And uh, the interesting thing is, Moses is praying this prayer. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to see your face. God, I've got to see your face. I don't, I'm not satisfied. In fact, God said, I'll bless you if you just keep going. I'll just, like, cause your enemies to be destroyed. Just go on, and you'll have favor all your days. He says, I'm not going anywhere unless you go with me. And he says, but I want to see you. And God said, okay, no one sees me and lives. Now, if we get real spiritual, we can say we're dead in Christ and we're alive to the fullness of what he has on the other side of the cross. So we could talk about that, but first you have to be dead to self, which means like if anyone spits on you, cusses you out, cuts you off on the road. No, you just don't even face. You're just like, you know. Six feet under mortuary style. You don't respond to things that dead men just don't respond, you know. So you have to be unresponsive to the world to be dead. So we're, we have to balance like, yeah, sure, you're dead, to, dead in Christ, but you just have to manifest that part of, of the death. And then the burial, then the resurrection. So he says, I want to see you, Lord. And, G and God says, no one sees me and lives, but I want to take you to a place that I have. And he says, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And then the rock covered him. And I says, I'm going to let my goodness pass by you. So he sits in the midst. Listen, guys, I need you to listen. Because what happens is he's in the midst of the covering of Christ, standing on the rock, in the cleft, covered by the rock, overshadowed and protected by the rock, and then in that place of covering, the Lord begins to show. He says, I can't show you me and live, but you could see my hinder parts. Which means literally you're going to see the essence of who I am. And he says, I'm going to cause my goodness to pass by you. And as he's seeing the train of God, as he flies by, he begins to light up. Literally, his face begins to shine like the bulbs in this room where people couldn't even look at him when he came back down the mountain. And not only that, but God began to show him in the book of Genesis, this is who Adam was, and this is what they ate of, and this is how they fell from me, and this is the lamb that was slain, and I brought the lamb, and I wrapped my son up because that's how much I loved you. And then he goes on, and he talks about the next, the next epic uh, part because he, he wants to show, and in this place in the, in the cleft of the rock, he shows his goodness. He didn't want to be in the cleft anymore, Chris. 
No, so that's good. He was going to come down and shine. You were ready to shine? <laughs> All right. God, be seated. Thank you, guys. You're shining, Joe. Joe is so wild. We have some funny people here. You guys got to meet him. Joe is, like, awesome. Joe is definitely awesome. Yes. All right, so... So here we go. Moses asked for this illustration. We must behold love to become love. We have to behold love to become love. And you have to look at love as the hinder parts. You're not going to see all of it and live. But as you see the parts that pass by you. Do you guys even know why we're letting people live in our house by the droves? It's so you could actually see what love looks like in the earth. Who in their right mind lets 30 people live in their house with their kids and their grandbaby? We don't want 30 people living in our house with our grandbaby and my daughter and my... This one guy said, I don't trust no man. I said, I must be a fool then because you're living in my house with my wife, with my kids, with my cars, with my stuff. And what do I got? Your underwear? You just got out of jail Eight years in jail, you just moved into my house and you trust no man. I think I, I think I missed God on this one. I told him, I think you need to go. Because if you don't trust nobody, I must be a fool. That's what I said to him. That same guy is one of my closest, closest uh, people in my life that, that trusts me like nobody else today. Because, in fact, he, he, he just did some awesome things for me and this huge favor that he would never do for anybody. Because he doesn't trust anybody. Because that's what 18 years in prison does to you. See, and I could have gotten offended because of how he was, but he didn't know who he was. So how do you keep loving when they don't know who they are? You've got to keep loving until they become lovable. You've got to love them through their unlovableness if you ever want to see change. But actually, all they're looking for is an example. Hmm. Hmm. So if you want somebody in your life to be more lovable, they just need to see someone that looks lovely. Because love attracts people. People want to become like love. They want to be this person. So here we're going we're gonna to wrap up on this. We love him because he first loved us. This is where it ended. We love him because he first loved us. Let's all stand to our feet. We love him because he first loved us. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to end on this point. We love him because... He first loved us. What does that actually mean? It means he became an example. He became an example of what love looked like so that we could be able to love. In other words, we didn't even have capacity to love. The amount that you love today is only because of the amount you've been shown love. Unfortunately, it's something within us that there's a model and then we become what we behold. We like to all think of how creative we are. I I think of myself as a pretty creative person in general. But reality is, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, said it this way. There's nothing new under the sun. So you can't create much when there's nothing new. Just think about it a while. So here we are in a place where if I want to become more lovable, I have to keep beholding what love looks like. And if there's no good examples around me, I need to behold the one who is love. Why is your relationship with God so paramount? It's because the only place you're going to see the purest form of love so that when you see it, you'll know what you're lacking in your life. It's not to make you feel horrible on the inside. It's to make you say, this, my God, is what I've been missing all my life. Can you move on my heart right now? And help me be who you are. Because you said where you are, there I'll be also. And we can just have the worship team come on up. It says greater 
hold on, I'm going to hold off on that. Here's what it says at the beginning of 1 John 4. It says that Christ has come in the flesh. The spirit, the sp- any spirit, it starts out this way. It's very interesting. I want you to follow this train of thought. If any spirit says that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, it is of God. Now, unfortunately, that will break a lot of theologians because we're looking for what's different to have a fight. Let go of your religious spirit and just realize that if someone says Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that person, that spirit is of God, is what it says at the beginning of the chapter. Well, interestingly enough, it goes on to say anyone that says Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh is not of God and they're of the Antichrist. Then it goes on even further to say, beloved children, aren't you glad you're not part of that system anymore? And then he says, because... Greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. What's he talking about? That Jesus Christ has come into you, your flesh, and made you greater than anything else against you. He's literally saying you have no more excuses for what you are because now you are greater than anything any system's ever done to you, any person's ever said about you, any abuse is ever given to you because greater is he that's in you. And if you keep saying my abuse is the reason why I'm captive, you're literally saying Jesus Christ hasn't come in my flesh. It's an antichrist that's come over the earth and come over the body of Christ even that says Christ is not bigger than what you've been through. And I'm just here to shed the light on this topic here today. God is love and God never fails. Whatever you've been through today, it's time you start saying God is bigger than my abuse. God is bigger than my molestation. God is bigger than my pain. God is bigger than anything I've gone through. And today, Lord, I say you've come in the flesh and greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. So we just release right now, release right now the favor of God over your life, the acceptance of your Father. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, just sweep through this place. If there's anybody in this room that needs to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I just want you to wave to me like this. Anybody in this room? Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to move to the next part because some people have been under this lie that I can't make it, I can't do it, I haven't been saved long enough. I don't know how you got there, but I don't know how to get there. I'm going to tell you this, guys. It wasn't by might and it wasn't by power. It wasn't by my wisdom. It wasn't by my strength. It wasn't by what I read. It was by who I met. By my spirit, says the Lord. Come on, somebody. And if that's you today and you're ready to get rid of that lie in your life, I need you at this altar right now. 